Here is Mr. Tedham, wheelwright of Northium in Sussex. He's making a hub for a new cartwheel. Grandfather Tedham started wheel making over 60 years ago, but the youngest Tedham will take up a different career. Mr. Tedham uses traditional methods, but he knows as surely as any textbook the correct size of a hub or the length of a spoke. He knows the fields and farmyards of his district, the roads and hills, the strength of horses, everything which determines how a wheel should be made. But let Mr. Tedham himself tell you about his work. The hub or nave of the wheel is roughly chopped out of a block of elm. The grain of this wood is not straight, so it is not easily split. Then the nave is smoothed and finished on the workshop lathe. The mortises, or slots for the spokes, must be carefully cut so that each spoke fits tightly as the correct outward slope, or dish, as we call it. Wheels are made dish-shaped for extra strength. This overcomes the outward thrust of the axle, which tends to loosen the spokes. Spokes must be very strong, but as light as possible. So they are made of oak, thick on the side nearest the cart, where the strength matters, and thin on the outside, where useless wood can be shaved away. Using this gauge, called a yoke set, I make sure that the spoke is in firm and straight. This driving in of spokes looks easy, but it's really a matter of timing, of giving the sledge the right force at the right moment of its swing. Spoke ends must be tongued to take the sections of the wheel rim, which are called fellies. The fellies, like the nave, must not split, so they are made of ash, elm or beech, roughly shaped and left to season. Now they must be chopped down to the final size. The seasoning of wood is important in wheel making. A year for each inch of thickness is a rough and ready rule. The fixing of the fellies is called ringing the wheel. And this tool, which we call a spoke dog, strains two spokes together while the fellie is slipped on. Then a blow here and a blow there with the sledge until the devils slip neatly into their devil holes. And so the wheel is ready for its metal tire. The length of iron wanted is measured by the number of turns of this wheel called a traveler. To fit tightly, the tire is made about an inch less in circumference than the wheel. A strip of iron is shaped through this tire bender, which can be set for different wheel sizes. In the forge, the smith eats the iron to make the shot, that is, to join the two ends together. On the anvil, the ends, slit so that they can be forced together, are hammered and welded into one. Now comes the exciting moment for me and the smith, the tire end of the wheel. The tire is heated in a huge fire to make it expand so that it can be slipped over the wheel. The wheel is screwed down to a metal platform. Now we call for all hands. We pull the red hot tire out of the fire, hooking our tongs onto the iron. We lift it and drop it onto the wheel. The touch of the hot iron makes the dry timber smolder and crackle. Now it's exciting time. The tire must be hammered into place before it has time to cool. Then we pour water hissing and bubbling on the tire so that it contracts tightly onto the wheel. Cracks and pops tell that the iron is forcing all the wood joints into place. And here's the finished job. I've made hundreds like this since I was a youngster, 